Now, the next paper is by Kai Conrad at the Max Planck Institute. All right. Um, <clears throat> the debt overhang is the overarching uh, topic of the session, and I will focus on government debt, more precisely on the excessive debt in some countries that caused the European debt crisis. I will not ask how this debt emerged. I will not sketch the history of the crisis. Instead, I will ask what was the most fundamental problem in the current financial architecture of the Eurozone, speaking about the governmental financial architecture, and what are the alternatives that could lead to a more sound fiscal architecture in the Eurozone. I will suggest two alternatives. One alternative, I think, is not suitable. One alternative will not work. Unfortunately, as it will turn out, this is the alternative in which politics moves into. The other alternative is a bit more difficult, but would work if we would, work in, in, if we would walk into this direction. So let me see. Do I have slides? Yes. Um, well, one can sort fiscal constitutions along two dimensions. One dimension is how autonomous are the countries when they make their, their borrowing decisions. And the other dimension is how responsible are they going to be about the debt they have chosen. So this creates a policy space and any financial constitution which you have you can place into this square. Um, unfortunately, not all financial constitutions in this square are sustainable. Actually, only two places in this square are really financially sustainable. It's the upper right corner in which every country can do what the country likes to do, but in case it has, done a, it has made a choice, it has to be responsible for this choice. This is the the decentralized version of what we typically know from day-to-day -day economics as well. If you make people responsible for what they do, they make the right choices, more or less. The other sustainable corner in this square is the lower left corner. This lower left corner is the fully centralized version of Europe. It's essentially, uh, you could take maybe France as the prototype model of this. France is pr probably one of the most centralized ver countries which we have in the Eurozone. It's a pretty much top-bottom approach. All revenues collected on the central stage, some revenues giving, given to administration down, further down in the administration, but essentially it's administrative federalism, if federalism at all. This is also sustainable because there's one decision maker as well, and this one decision maker is responsible for the outcomes. In the Eurozone, uh, I mean, the founding fathers of the Eurozone were pretty much aware of, of this situation and this problem, and they tried to place us in the Eurozone in this upper right corner. The, the cornerstone of this, I mean, there were several cornerstones, but the most important cornerstone, which should have brought us to the upper right corner, is the Ar Article 125 of the now Lisbon Treaty. It had different numbers earlier on, but the bailout, the no bailout clause was the cornerstone that should bring us in this upper right corner. Unfortunately, as we know, when things moved on and uh, everything looked fine on paper, but when, it, when things moved on, uh, we found out that uh, there is, you could say, a paradigm lost because we realized that we are not in this upper right corner. When Greece had its trouble in uh, May 2010, uh, we didn't uh, see the, respons the national responsibility for this debt, but we realized we are actually in the left, upper left corner of this diagram. We, we had a lot of autonomy in the different countries in the Eurozone. Formally, there were some limits. The limits were not really enforced. There was really a lot of autonomy, and now we found out there was essentially no fiscal responsibility on the nation state. Rather than that, we saw a lot of bailout programs. So 
there are two ways to approach this. If we know, if we, know we are in the left upper corner, um, there are two ways to approach this. One way is trying to get back to the right upper corner. This is actually what I would favor, and I would like to make some suggestions about how to move there. So it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly not easy, because as, um, as Anat Admati already uh, outlined, it's essentially the banks that make this, uh, this whole process rather difficult. Um, and therefore, what you have to do in order to enforce a no bailout clause is to, to remove all those obstacles which were responsible for the fact that in May 2010 we did not have uh, a bankruptcy of Greece. So there were obstacles, and these obstacles were tied to banking business, tied to financial markets. At least this is what politicians told us. They told us this is actually too risky. This will, this will risk a, a meltdown of the financial system. So what you have to do is to address those issues that made the no bailout clause not time consistent. You have to make it time consistent, and that means you have to address the situation in the financial markets. A lot of equity would be very good. Other means to reduce systemic risk would also be good. And I will talk about a third thing, which I think matters a lot, a lower involvement of European banks in government financing. Looking at the figures, 35% of the government debt, of the European government debt, is in the hands of European banks. Why that? Is that traditionally banking business, collecting money from private people, and then not doing any risk transformation, not doing any, uh, any, any other types of transformations, not collecting huge amounts and giving it to enterprises which need larger amounts than we have in our private pockets? No. They buy government bonds. This is pretty much the most boring business which you can do in the financial markets, and it's certainly not the core competence of banks. But this is what overwhelmingly they are doing. And they are doing it for a good reason. They are subsidized to do this. They don't need equity requirements on this. They can easily turn these, these assets into the central banking uh, accounts and get fresh money for this, even if it's very I mean, if, even if these are very poor assets, really, in some cases, uh, they still get fresh money for that. And also, there's the implicit bailout guarantee. If they, if they involve, if you are sufficiently involved in this business, they can rely on being rescued in case because they are systemic. So really, it's government that created this problem in the first place. But the way to solve it is actually to move the banks out of this business and back to the business they are actually supposed to do and which they don't do. Actually, in Germany, we have a lot of Landesbanken and so on. They were founded because the banks didn't do their business. They didn't lend to, 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 to private people and to small enterprises. So they created, I mean, first of all, the government draws away the money from the banks, then finds out the banks don't do what they should do, and then they create governmental agencies to substitute for what the banks are actually doing. So I think there are, there are side benefits from going along this road. Unfortunately, the po politics, and we heard this with, uh, with, uh, with Jörg Asmussen this morning, politics goes in the completely opposite direction. It tries to move Europe into the left lower corner which in principle is also sustainable. Uh, in, in some sense, if you have only one decision taker, which is the EU Commission or uh, the, EU, say, the, the EU, government, EU governments that, that come together uh, and, and make these decisions, and they are essentially, uh, they have the decision rights, how much debt each country should run, and they have also the responsibility if things go wrong, then this works. I mean, uh, to, 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 to document that we have this movement down to the left lower corner, we have the rescue devices. Um, nowadays, we have a conglomerate of rescue devices. We don't really know very much how they interact with each other. They probably don't just add. There, there are lots of other things involved in this. I think we haven't really studied how, how these different rescue devices actually interact with each other. But what we can see is that what, what, what was initially an outcry, these 45 billion for Greece, this was a scandal when this came up in February 2010, is nothing in comparison to what we have today. And second, of course, we have the large program um, 
which shifts essentially more control, more power of control to the, gov to the government sector of the highest level in, in Europe, which is the Commission and uh, the, 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 uh, the Council. And uh, I don't want to name all these uh, fancy things. And actually, it's worthwhile to study this from also from a political economy perspective. I think the EU, EU Commission is clearly the winner of the financial crisis in Europe. And it's also interesting to see this from a bureaucracy perspective. But that's not, that's not my talking, uh, my, my talk, what's my talk about. Um, the, the bottom line is they shift control, they try to shift control to the, to the, to the, to the center of Europe. And I'm trying to explain why I think this is not going to move. Uh, this is not going to work. It's, it's, easy to con it's, not, it's not even easy to control your kid about its spending behavior. Five minutes, that's perfect. Um, it's not easy to control your kid, but it's one person, it has a limited, uh, uh, it has a limited op uh, opportunity set, it's fairly simple. It's more complicated to control a, a company uh, to, in terms of what it does with its debt and so on. But it really, really gets out of control if we talk about a government. And to give you some insight on that, um, this is uh, something about German experience on bailouts. Germany is a federation and it has small lender in this, uh, in this federation and some of them have been bankrupt and they have been bailed out. In particular, Bremen is some, something like the most fascinating case study. They have been bailed out for 10 years. They received 8.5 billion euro this is on a per capita basis. Let me see, this is on a per capita basis, 15,000 euro over the time period of 10 years. They started off in this bankruptcy situation with a per capita debt in Bremen of 13,000 euro. They received 15,000 euro. At the end of this process, each Bremen citizen had a debt of 17,000 euro. This is how in Germany you do checks and balances on controlling a subsidy, a, a, a government lower down that's still less complicated than a country like Portugal or Greece. And you see, this doesn't work. Bremen nowadays has 27 or more thousand euro per capita debt in this little country, and they still get money. And all this, did not, I mean, they didn't send the money and say, here, do what you like. No, no, there were strict there were ties, strings, there were strings attached to this. It was really what you call in Europe conditionality attached to this, and it didn't work. And my claim is, if this doesn't work in Germany, this doesn't work in Europe as well. And this is why I think from an economic point of view, this is, this is not going to work. This, the, but th this is only one part of the, the, the problem. The real part of the problem, and I don't want to talk, I, I would like to talk much, much more about this, but I can't. Let me just use one minute for this. The real problem is that this whole process led Europe into a situation where the different countries and the populations in the different countries have completely opposite perceptions of what's going on. So if people have the same perception about a problem, they can solve the problem. But what you have in Europe is that the different nations have very different perceptions about the problem. You see in Germany, Austria, Finland, the Netherlands, they are tired of sending money to the southern countries. Whether this is the right perception or not, but this is the perception. In these southern countries, you have just the opposite per uh, perception. They don't want this control, right? Uh, Chancellor Merkel is, is, is depicted uh, with a Nazi uniform there. Even the British newspapers write articles saying, the Germans now take over. This is the time of the Fourth, fourth Reich. Militarily, they couldn't beat at us. Now they do it in economic terms. And my perception is that more than the economic problems of going towards centralization, these perceptions and the political risks they Im involve, uh, they are really harmful for the European project. And I'm saying this as a true European. I mean, this sounds really very anti-European. But I would like to rescue Europe. And I'm afraid that we will, we will, we will lose Europe just, in, just trying to, to, to rescue the Eurozone. And that's a very dangerous policy. Thank you very much.